words in that one. I, I think I almost got them on. I might have slaughtered a few of them, but that's a great song. And uh, I was told that that was, uh, came out of the scripture that we're looking at. So that's interesting, isn't it? Um, that it was actually, had the person that wrote it had the mind of thinking about Jesus coming, his return. So, um, and the writer on that is, the writer is Julia Ward Howe, music by William Steph. So, okay, this is another one that, I'm sorry Kyle couldn't be here because this is one of his, used to be his favorite when he was a little, little guy. We haven't seen, um, sung it in a really long time, but he, when he was in elementary school, this was his favorite song uh, done in church. So this is called, There's a Redeemer. You guys know this one. We just do it a little differently than the hymn. Okay, go up. Four. Five. Five. There we go. Thank you. Oh, Thank you, five? Casey. Yeah, it is five. We're going way up on this one. Okay. All right. going to give us everything we need now to live this life, even as we get close to the end. So this is another word, another song that was probably inspired by the scripture we looked at last week called Holy is the Lord. Um, this one is by Chris Tomlin. And Louis Giglio. Giglio. That's a cool one. I like that. Giglio.
called You Came, and it's by uh, uh, Melissa Hessler and Jonathan David Hessler. wonder if they're related to the Hesslings. I don't know. <laughs> um, anyway, love this song, what it says. It's called You Came. It's called the Lazarus Song. And um, we're going to get ready for Bible study with this song because, um, you know, without Jesus, we would all be in the grave, dead, destruction, but he came. So I really like the lyrics of this song. thing is working me really hard I have to say uh, studying for this is taking me twice as long this is new um, as anything else because there's so much there and so I'm not covering as much space as I have been since we've going chronologically through the Bible we've been going you know pretty clipping along but now it's like whoa this takes a little more time and so um, if you could um, come to prayer with me before we go over this piece that we've been talking about. And, uh, and if you didn't get to see last week, the throne of God, um, go back and, and, and look at that so that you um, can go with us through this. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we humbly seek your face. Um, on our knees we pray that we say nothing outside of your will that we give you complete obedience as we explore your word. 
speak to our hearts with your Holy Spirit in Jesus name amen so last week we did go over the throne of God as described by Revelation 4 and 5 pretty amazing uh, go back and see it and we talked about a little bit I want to make a clarification uh, simply because my my buddy Tim told me I wanted not to be confused that we talked about how um, the tabernacle at the time and even the temple at one point imitated um, the throne of God so there was the Holy of Holies and, and stuff so in the Holy of Holies uh, after Jesus died the curtain tore and uh, because God left the building right because now the Holy of Holies the Holy Spirit is now moving to the church the people the Holy Spirit is now in us and so our temp our bodies become temples that emulate the throne of God and the clarification is we are not the throne of God but we should be temples where God is enthroned right so in other words we submit to the Holy Spirit he lives in us he is on the throne of our lives right he's on the throne which is why Satan works so hard to get us to crawl back up there and pretend that we are there <coughs> so that he can get us off track. God is enthroned in us in the temple of God. Um, should we submit to do that? Which is all about humility. It's all about humility. And so as we look at the scripture, um, we looked at uh, the going to the throne of God, which would be the church in the throne of God, worshiping God, and then at the next place we're looking at is Revelation 6. And we can look, and we talked about last week, this the concept of the rapture, which many theologians, in fact, most of them, uh, believe in some sort of rapture, this event where you go to heaven. And as we looked at last week, the, the heaven door opens, and there people are drawn up to the throne. Because, so that would be the event, the only other time the heaven opens is like that time and then at the very end. So there is an indication by most theologians that there's some event where the church is removed from what's about to happen. Now this verse, this, what we're looking at tonight in Revelation 6 is, is not pretty and it's not fun because it's what's gonna happen then. And we're gonna break it down. And of course, I just wanna say ahead of time, there's multiple opinions on many things. And you really have to look at all pieces of scripture to pull things out and dig them up and really look at them uh, before, you know, trying to make an attempt to see what God is saying. But even in the words themselves, they say something very deep. And so we're going to look at that. And there is, same, why is there some confusion between the end of the world and rapture and tribulation and maybe the pre-tribulation and there's some cute confusion but we do see several times in the Bible that the Bible speaks that um, there will be, we will begin to see some events. So either way, we will begin to see some events. Um, like I said, most theologians believe the church is taking out, taking out. And we gave several passages of scripture to support that. I do have friends who don't think that will be taken out. We're going to go all the way through to the end. But there's a lot of scripture and a lot of people that really hold to the fact that the church is removed. We're going to talk some of that about tonight. Then um, things are going to get really bad as the final judgment unfolds. Okay? Um, many believe that these seals describe what happened on earth during the Roman Empire. And maybe it was. So there's this opinion that all this thing happened was just happened in the Roman Empire with Nero and Caligula and, you know, Domitian and all these weird people that killed Christians. Okay? And there are similar things that rolled out during that time, and, and maybe it is, but um, in the very least, it might have a parallel double meaning that these things will also fold out in detail in the future. And for one thing, the reason that it gives us an idea that this is not just referring to that time is because the severity of what we're about to read is more than what happened during the Roman Empire. So there's some similarities. The severity is way is, is more intense. So, um, and so most believe that these events have not yet come due to the severity of what they're going to say. So when we see the judgment in chapter 6, it's going to be very bad, which is why Luke 21, 36 says, pray that you will escape this. Another, and that gives an indication like, be ready so you don't have to go through this. 
pray that you will escape this. In other words, something, there's something you can do to get out of this, which indicates, again, the rapture. Some kind of event where we're pulled to heaven and we meet with Jesus. So there's an event where we meet with Jesus in the sky, and then the revelation rolls out, and then Jesus comes back and finishes everything in the end. So that's what we're looking at. And what we're looking at is now the four horses that you never want to see, right? So Dell showed me this picture of these horses of different colors, you know, white, black, red, and green, and it says underneath, four horses you don't want to see, right? Okay, so the horsemen of the apocalypse are what we're talking about tonight. And so if you read with me, I'm going to read a little piece and then we'll talk about it. I'll read it exactly the way that it's written, starting in 6-1 if you're following along. Then I saw when the Lamb broke one of the seven seals. Oh, and I want to say really quick. The seven seals, many theologians bring, is like the deed to earth. Like, it's like the deed ownership to earth. This is what's going to unfold on earth. And only the Lamb, if you recall last time, only the Lamb the slain lamb, the lion of Judah, was able to open the seal, if you recall. Uh, so, version are you I am in the New American Standard Version. Okay? All right. Here it goes. Then I saw when the lamb broke one of the seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures saying with the voice of thunder, Come! And I looked, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on it had a bow, and the crown was given to him, and when and he went out conquering and to conquer. Okay, a little note here is it doesn't say he had the, that the bow was loaded with arrows or that he had a quiver. So it's a bow, kind of pronouncing strength, but possibly nothing coming other than to conquer or to seem to be conquering uh, a presence. So we're going to look at that. So... Um, in these days, you have to understand when John's writing this on the island of Patmos, um, and he's in exile, for him to see a horseman, that's significant, because in those days, if you heard, if you were out in your field or in your village doing your work, and you heard the sound of thundering horses, you would stop and pay attention, because that's when people die. And often, when people would come in war against others, there would be the sound of thundering hooves, and there they were. So people paid attention. So in those days, a horse was significant of people in power, and obviously a horse has tremendous power and beauty. Horses are amazing creatures, and it is interesting to me that this is a horseman riding in on, on that. So we know that that something has happened here, and whatever it is, this is a great conqueror who seems to be celebrated in popularity. And maybe nothing bad is happening as a white horse, so maybe everybody thinks peace and prosperity. Maybe everybody thinks everything's okay. And a theologian I like to listen to named Skip Heitzig says that in the same way when Hitler came in World War I, and I probably, I imagine that a lot of people thought the world was about to end about that time, if you think about it, because at first, everyone liked Hitler, except for Winston Churchill. He was the only one going, hey, this is not cool, you know? And, and if you recall, um, Metaxas in the book Bonhoeffer talks about how all of the churches, most of the churches, not, but out of, oh, 13,000 churches, only 7,000 thought there was a problem with Hitler. And then that got to be less and less, you know? And here's Bonhoeffer, this young preacher, going, don't listen, don't listen. Of course, he was executed. <clears throat> but anyway, if you recall, and if you recall, do you recall that even the Olympic Games were held in Berlin? It's like, and there was this protest back in the United States saying, should we go, should we not go? And then he kind of did this fake thing, even invited a Jewish girl to compete in the Olympics. Kind of act, oh, everyone will be accepted. Everyone will be okay. This Jewish girl shows up for the German Olympics, and she was actually, I think she was a high jumper, I don't remember. But then, of course, at the last minute, she was not allowed to compete. So he just came across as, oh, yeah, we're all cool, and everyone is really great. But only when we went to the Olympics did we really realize 
this is not a good thing. So um, I was just really happy that Jesse Owens won so many things. <laughs> so, um, and several did many other people of color and different ethnicities in that Olympics, which was great. He won many medals. So anyway, in the same way that Hitler came, just came booming out of nowhere and everyone thinks, great, 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 um, this guy is gonna come. And it won't be bad at first. Although if you think about um, the church being taken away, and, um, and there will be some that, that maybe will like, whoa, what do you miss? And then there's quite a bit of controversy like, will people be able to wake up and get saved? And I was listening to Chuck Smith today about that. He's like, I would love to think. You know, I feel like because of what's written in the scriptures, I think people will be able to wake up and get saved in the end, but they'll have to suffer a martyr's death. He said, you know, there's some scriptures, and we'll get to that, that kind of give an indication that maybe, maybe you won't get another chance if you had one. So Chuck Smith says, don't wait for that. <laughs> I don't know, you know, and I agree. You don't want to, you don't want to wait around. Why would you wait when you're offered everything? Uh, but the world is just so lost, and some people are just gonna be like, "Man, I." Hopefully, they'll realize, not take the mark. But anyway, so the other things that we learn is that in this time, what is confusing is um, Scripture talks about in Thessalonians, Second Thessalonians two three. If you want to, we're going to jump around a little, and I'm sorry, but we have to do this to unpack the scripture. Um, don't let anyone deceive you in any way, for in the last day will not come until the rebellion. Some versions say the falling away. So, um, depending on what you're reading, there'll be a great falling away before the man of lawlessness is revealed, the man doomed to destruction. He will oppose and will exalt himself over everything that is God is that is called God or is worship, so that he sets himself up in the great temple, pro proclaiming himself to be God. Don't you remember when I was with you? I used to tell you these things. So, um, and now you know that what he's holding back, so that he may be revealed at the proper time. Oh, so now you know what is holding him back. Sorry, let's go back. Verse six. And now you know what is holding him back, so that he may be re revealed in the proper time. For the secret power of the lawlessness is already at work, meaning the work of the devil is already happening. But something really big is going to happen. But the one who now holds him back will continue to do so till he is taken out of the way. And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord Jesus will overthrow with the breath of his mouth by the splendor of his coming. The coming of the lawlessness, one, the lawless one, will be in accordance with the work of Satan, it's displayed in all kinds of counterfeit miracles, signs, and wonders, and every sort of evil that deceives those who are perishing. And they will perish because they refuse to love the truth or so be saved. So here's the deal. People perish not because of their sin, but because they refuse to love the truth and be saved. They refuse the remedy for sin. We were all sinners. We're all sinners. But we will perish if we refuse the remedy God provided. So for this reason, God sent them a powerful delusion so that they will believe the lie, so that all will be condemned who have not believed the truth but have delighted in wickedness. But we ought to always thank God for you, brothers, loved by the Lord. Um, from the beginning, God chose you and to be saved through the sanctifying work Holy Spirit to believe in truth. And this is confusing. It's like, well, if you're deceived, then how do you get judged? It says you walk into, you walk into deception when you sin. It's like walking into a cave. And then the farther go that you go in, the darker it is. So when we don't listen to God, when we disobey the truth, we walk into this darkness that envelops and cloaks over us. Now, this is really what, what I'm bringing this up for decide to pull all the pieces of the scripture, some pieces of the scripture together, is to see that it's talking about the restrainer. Now, most theologians, again, believe that what's holding back the lawless one from being completely revealed 
is the Holy Spirit working in people, right? How does the Holy Spirit work on this earth? Through people. Through people. So mo most theologians believe, and we talked about this when we went over Thessalonians, that the, the people are, the holy people of God are the restrainer. And so people are like, well, where's the, where's the Antichrist? Where, well, we, according to this, we, we won't know who he is because we'll be gone. If, if the holy people of God are the restrainer, and they're removed, and then and that makes perfect sense. It makes perfect sense because the lawlessness, the lawless one, would not be able to come into power as long as the restrainer is present. Does that make sense? So, um, so um, believing that something happens where goodness and the restraining, the the Holy Spirit working here is removed. Then the lawless one emerges. And that fits in together with this white horseman. The, the horseman on the white horse. Because it seems like he's conquering. And at first everyone may like him. And they may think, oh, maybe he solves some problems. Um, because in several scriptures, which we'll review too, it will seem like peaceful times. It will seem like things are going well. And then, boom, something changes. So, again, in Hebrews 6, 4, um, and so, again, we're not, what are we accountable for? We're accountable to be submissive to the Holy Spirit no matter what happens, right? That's what we're accountable for, that we humbly seek God. And so, uh, but a really interesting verse that we were talking about today that goes along with this, Hebrews 6, 4, for it is impossible in the case of those who have once been enlightened, having tasted of the heavenly gift, and have been partakers of the Holy Spirit, have tasted of the good work of God and the powers of the age to come, and then are falling away to restore them to repentance, since again they crucify themselves, the Son of God, and put him to open shame. Now obviously, um, God takes back people who stray. This is saying something much different. I mean, it's deeper. It's like, so these are some of the verses that I've, it's like indication that you had this one incredible opportunity, you were close to God, and then you walk away. And some say this is like the, the part of sin is if you're worried about it, you'll never do it. Because what happens when you completely reject God and walk away, his wrath just lets you go. His wrath lets you go. So that's that's indicated. That's a heavy verse. So it makes us think, you know, we definitely shouldn't take, we definitely shouldn't spit at or, or you know, blink at any opportunity that we have to get close to God. And our society is going to face judgment if it doesn't listen to the truth that God is calling them to. So um, it is possible that for a while, many people will not immediately notice a problem after the church is removed. And I'm like, how could that be? You know, if the church is removed, planes are going to crash, little children are going to disappear all over. I mean, we've seen the movies, right? You know, left behind. And, you know, how, how would it not be noticeable? There will be some explanation. And maybe this is how the um, man of lawlessness will be revealed to be like, Somebody will have this explanation for why the people are gone. Like, oh, these are the people that the universe didn't want here because of their beliefs. There's going to be an explanation. And here's what's weird. Most people will believe it. And maybe it's the lawless one who presents the explanation. And so all of a sudden, and think of the great, think of the great wealth. I mean, if all of a sudden all of the Christians are gone, People are just going to be grabbing for all the stuff that's here. And so for a while, it might seem like prosperity. Wow, we got rid of a whole bunch of people, and now here we are. We got all their stuff. So who knows what's going to happen? But we look at the scriptures, and 1 Thessalonians 5 says, For you yourselves know fully well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. And when they are saying peace and safety, so this lends to this concept. Well, they will be saying peace and safety and the destruction will come upon them suddenly like labor pains upon a woman with child and no 
and they will not escape, but you, brethren, are not in darkness. That day would overtake you like a thief. But you, brethren, are not in darkness. That day would overtake you like a thief. So, um, thank God oh, we won't be there. But the people will be like, peace and safety, everything's cool, great, great, great. We've got this guy, he's doing, he's, he's our, he's amazing, he's rescuing everyone. The economy is great, the world is perfect. Probably have one government, everything will be going well. But then the second seal happens. So back to Revelation, uh, chapter 6, verse 3. When he broke open the second seal, I heard the second living creature saying, Come. And another red horse came out, and to him who sat on it was granted to take peace from the earth. And that man would slay, that men would slay one another, and a great sword was with him. So at some point, the world is going to break out in a war. Amazing, terrible destruction. Um, Skip Heitzig was saying that the Center for Defense Information said that um, there are now nine countries that have nuclear weapons. Uh, the U.S. alone has 35,000. And each of those is capable of 35 times Hiroshima. That's a lot of weapons. And of all the countries that now have them, we have U.S., England, France, Russia, China, India, Pakistan, North Korea, and Israel, although they won't say they do. Right out. So we have this amazing capacity to destroy the world several times over. And so that's the second seal. And then, right after that, comes the third seal. Reading on, and when he broke the third seal, I heard the third living creature saying, Come! And I looked, and behold, the black horse who sat on it was a pair of scales in his hands. And I heard something like a voice in the center of the living creature saying, A quart of wheat for a denarius, and three quarts of barley for a denarius, or denarii, however you say it, and do not damage the oil and wine. So the scale reminds me of the writing on the wall. If you remember Daniel, this just, I know it means a lot of things. The one thing I remember is the writing on the wall in Daniel was um, meeny, meeny, tekel, you farsen. And so reading from Daniel, uh, I think it's 7, but I forgot to write the chapter, verse 25. It says, and this is the writing that was inscribed, meeny, meeny, tekel, parson. And this interpretation of, mat of the matter, meeny, God has numbered your days and your kingdom is brought to the end. Tekel, you have been weighed in the balances and found wanting. This is what I was thinking when I was reading this. And Paris, your kingdom will be divided between the Medes and the Persians. So what is happening in this third seal is now the wrath is unfolding. And if you know the meanings of, so, not, so you're going to be measured in the balance. Found wanting. And it's important to know that the equivalence they give for these measures is the amount that one soldier, the least amount that one soldier would get in one day's service of wheat. The very smallest ration that he would be allowed to eat when times were tough was this amount of wheat. And the amount that it's paid for is everything he would make that day. So in other words, you will, pay, you will pay every day only to eat. And then the reason that barley is referred to there is because barley is a lesser quality grain often fed to animals. So at times, people will be eating what the animals would eat. So that's what's important on this. Everything you will have be used to eat at this time. So, the rider on the black horse, opening the this herald, is a color of the condition of what's going to happen. And you know, following any 
Um, the metaphor in this in this scripture that's used in the, in the Greek is the same metaphor as if like to take on a yoke of slavery. That's interesting, right? To take on a yoke of slavery. And so, of course, black would go along with this. And, and with every time there is a war, there's often disease. And of course, in a nuclear fallout, you can imagine what would happen. Um, the ground, I mean, just think of Chernobyl, all the things that happened at Chernobyl and how everything was contaminated. Imagine what would happen to the earth and what we have left after a nuclear war. You can just imagine. And there's been all kinds of movies trying to figure that out, but, but it would be devastating. And so therefore, eating would be more difficult. Looking then at the fourth seal, the death seal, um, verse seven. When the lamb broke open the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature saying, come. And I looked and behold, an ashen horse. So some say kind of a green color. And he who sat on the horse named Death, and Hades was following with him. And so these two, right, these two things go together, kind of like Bonnie and Clyde. These two things are together, and they're everything horrible that you can imagine. And, hor and um, authority is given over to the, over a fourth of the earth, to kill with sword and famine and pestilence and by wild beasts of the earth fourth of the earth then will just that's right now I think there's around 7 billion people so we're looking at over a billion people almost 2 billion people being destroyed all at once all at once or at, during that time anyway so um, we can look at a couple things the sword is a symbol for violence death right weapons war violence um, famine obviously means there's no food. The ground is contaminated, destroyed. You know, like, if you think about it, even in the old, old ancient days, one of the things they'd do if they came into an area, if they wanted to starve out the enemy, they'd burn up all the fields so that the enemy can't eat. Take them out by starvation. Pestilence is a symbol for disease, which could be Poor water, definitely viruses, bacteria, and radiation could be included in those things. And then wild beasts. And wild beasts in this one is why some people think that uh, this is referring to the Roman arena because uh, Bishop Ignatius, who was uh, one of the bishops of, bishops of the early church, um, saint of God, um, in 110 AD, the bishop of Ignatius was thrown to the beast in the Colosseum. So some people think this is just um, talking about what happened during the Roman Empire during the persecution of the church. Maybe it was referring to that, but it's also much deeper because um, a quarter of the world being killed. Now, so the Black Plague, Black Plague killed a lot of people. Around a quarter of that time, but not all over everywhere. It did kill a lot of people. So this could represent a number of different times in scripture, but a quarter of the people is a lot of people. <coughs> so, um, so we look to see that um, the Asbury commentary says, in the fourth seal, one of the living creature commands come, calling forth, representing conquest, war, famine, and death. And then um, this depicts, everything depicted in these seals is would happen to any empire built on conquest. So like any empire built on conquest, like Hitler, several different empires we've seen, um, you know, Alexander the Great rambled across the earth in a short period of time just conquering everybody, the Roman Empire. So there's so many things that it could mean, but because of these different things, because of the severity, because of all the different pieces, it, it just, it's pointing ahead. I mean, and most theologians who spend all their life studying scriptures, you know, when I was studying kinesiology, there were people who'd been studying the scriptures in Greek 
for, for before I was born. And I look to those people to say, hey, what do you see here? Because you've been looking at the scripture a lot longer than I have, and I've been looking at it a long time. And, and many of them think it's going forward. This is a sign of the end. So, the fifth seal. The fifth seal, it says, and it's referring to martyrs. It says in verse 9, when the Lamb broke the fifth seal, I saw underneath the altar the souls of those who had been slain because of the word of the Lord and because of the testimony which they had maintained. And they cried out in a loud voice, How long, O Lord, true, holy, and true, will you refrain from judging and avenging the blood who have, of those who have dwelt on the earth? And there was given each of them a white robe, and they were told that they should rest for a little longer. It is, that is the number of their fellow servants and their brethren who were to be killed, and even as they had been, would be completed. So what this seems to be saying it's like God has not forgotten the cries of the saints, those who have been hurt and wounded and even martyred. But he says, wait, he gives them their reward. Part of their reward, their, their white robes. He says, wait, the time is not yet completed. But what he's really saying is, I'm going to take care of it all. But you have to wait for the time. Again, this is another reason that people think this was the Roman Empire because so many Christians were martyred during the Roman Empire. Colosseums all over the Roman Empire. People were murdered and thrown to beasts and lions and lit on fire and all those things. So that's another reason people think this. But as you see here, God says, wait, I'm gonna, the wrath is coming. The time, wait, wait. And, and it's good to know, and I guess this is the, some of the things that we take home from this, is someday everything will be made right. Everything will be set right, right? Someday. But not today. You've got to be patient. You've got to wait. Everything will be settled. Looking at the sixth seal, some refer to this as the terror. Verse 12. I looked when he broke the sixth seal, and there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth made of hair, and the whole moon became like blood. And we've seen here, when it's a fire, the moon like looks red, right? And even the sun looks red. But for the sun to look black, man, other than an eclipse, I haven't seen that. Black as sackcloth. That's, that's like an eclipse, right? Um, and the stars of the sky fell to the earth, as a fig tree crass, casts its unripe figs when shaken by a great wind. And the sky was split apart like a scroll, and then it was rolled up, and every mountain and island were moved out of the, their places. <laughs> I was listening to Chuck Smith today. He's like, is this really too bad? Because I was planning on spending the millennium in Hawaii. <laughs> <laughs> But anyway, this is an indicator that we have not seen this. We have not seen this. So look at it again. The sky will split apart like a scroll when it's rolled up. And every mountain and island were moved out of their places. Every mountain and island. And the kings of the earth and the great men and the commanders and the rich and the strong and every slave, free men, hid themselves in the caves along with the rocks and the mountains. In other words, there will be no separation between the rich and the poor in this moment. They will all be the same, in fear. And they said, say to the mountains and rocks, fall on us, hide us from the presence of him, capital him, who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the lamb, for the great day of their wrath has come. And who is able to stand? We haven't seen that. People beg when every part of the earth is shaken and people beg to be covered by the mountains. That's, that's crazy. That's, I can't even imagine. Like just the other night driving home, I saw an unusual star fall from the sky. And it, and it seemed like it was so big. It was like, what, was that something that crashed? Because it went clear down and turned green at the end. And I was like, wow, this is, it was a meteor. It had to have been a meteor, but it got very close. 
turn green at the end. It was very strange. And I was like, what was that? But if you could imagine looking out on the sky and having everything falling, that's something. That's a cosmic catastrophe. Um, so there's a really good commentary on the end times. It's the African Bible commentary. They, uh, for whatever reason, it's a, it's a, a Wesleyan commentary, but that African Bible commentary spent a great deal of time really pouring over this section of scripture, and I found it very helpful in looking at that. But what we see here is that God's wrath comes on all who refuse to repent for their sins. And this goes from present, past, and to future. It is like a continuation of all time coming to a culminating event. And so that's really interesting. So the main themes here are you don't want to be around for the stampede, right? This is not a horseman you want to see. Because um, the sinful world will be judged. It will be judged. So we got to follow Jesus now. And the important thing is that God has promised to save the righteous. He's promised it. He, is, he has victory over death. He said that hundreds of times in scripture, that he has victory over death. God offers this salvation to all. If you look at Revelation 3.30, which we went over, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man, person, hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and will sup with him and he with me. In other words, I will come in. If any man will surrender, any person will surrender, I will come in and have fellowship. Permanent fellowship with that person. However, if you refuse this offer, you will not escape the wrath of God, and there will be no one but you to blame. And Jesus himself warns us um, every time Jesus talked about the end times, he said, be careful that you're not deceived. Every time he talks about the end, be careful that you're not deceived. He talks about these events. Um, and in the next few weeks, I'm going to stop here. We'll go to the next chapter. But in the next few weeks, when we look at these other pieces, there are other things that fold inside to this whole thing that happens. So if you look at the next chapter, it says, uh, the angel said, hold off, hold off. There's something that has to happen. We're going to look at that next week. We're not going to go there tonight. Um, but just remember, Jesus talking about his return. Jesus came from the temple, was going away with his disciples to the point to point out the temple buildings. And he said to them, do you see these things? Truly I say unto you, not one stone will be left on another, which will all be torn down. So that was his prediction, which happened in 70 A.D., the complete Jerusalem temple was torn down. And he goes on to talk about um, many things, the Mount of Olives. They say, tell us, when will these things happen? And when is the sign of your coming, the people ask? When is the end of the age? They ask Jesus. And definitely if there's anyone we want to listen to, it's Jesus. And he says this. And Jesus said, answered them and said, see to it that no one misleads you. For many will come in my name, saying, I am a Christ and will mislead many. And you'll be hearing of wars and rumors of wars. See to it that you are not frightened, for these things must take place. But that is not the end yet. For a nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. In various places where there will be famines and earthquakes. But all of these things are merely the beginning of the birth pains. So I just wanted to point out that Jesus talked about many of these things in um, Matthew 24, if you want to look at that. So let's close in prayer. And just remember that, you know, these things are frightening to think about, but really, they're only frightening if you don't know Jesus. Because God has promised that we are delivered. We, we God has promised that because of salvation, we will not see his wrath. He disciplines us, he works us, he uses us, but we will not see his wrath. Thank Jesus, right? Heavenly Father, we thank you for the scripture. 
Uh, we thank for that um, the messengers that you've sent to us over the courses of history. May we be diligent students to listen to you as we read the words that were given to us. Lord, we ask that we would humbly seek you and help us to be vessels to this world in darkness that many will come to know you, that there will be a revival like that's happening in Asbury College right now, that that, re that revival will spread across the nation among our young people and the people will begin to see you. Lord Jesus, we pray that you would humble us, that we would seek God, that all the things happening now would just bring us closer to you. Help us to know our place in building the wall that you have, the, the, the mission that each of us have. And we ask you in Jesus' name, we pray for those who are sick, we pray for those who are hurting, and um, help us to be a light in the darkness. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Step out of here.